Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you could uh, take your seats, we're ready to begin our next session in which we'll be discussing uh, a topic which I'm sure if I told you this was the what we'd be talking about even two years ago, you wouldn't have a single clue what an NFT was. They've really ex exploded in the past um, 18 months, I would say, in the art market. Although they have been around for a lot longer, they were a much more... Um, confined to a sort of specific interest group of, uh, of computer enthusiasts. And since the, uh, the nearly $70 million sale of a, of a work by Beeple every day the, last, uh, the first 500 years at Christie's, they've become a topic of mainstream uh, art world discussion. We can see that big artists who everyone knows, like Damien Hirst, Marina Abramovich, are getting involved. The British Museum has uh, minted NFTs, the Uffizi. Uh, and so NFTs are now very much part of the mainstream art world conversation. Um, we'll be joined, well, I'm joined today by uh, three, um, three panelists to give different perspectives on, uh, on NFTs. Uh, Christiana Ina Kimber uh, Boyle from uh, Pace Gallery, the um, gallery with um, roots in the United States, but now with um, outlets all around the world. Uh, Mazdaq Senai, uh, co-founder and CEO of Avon Art, a uh, platform which matches young uh, and uh, entry-level collectors with new works of art. And uh, Kenny Shashta, a writer, artist, lecturer, and curator, uh, who in almost every story which I uh, encountered reading about him doing research for this was also described as a gadfly. <laughs> whatever that means, uh, but a, a man who wears many hats. First of all, let's start with some basics. What is an NFT? Because I think that's the point at which a lot of people tune out of this uh, discussion. An NFT secures an asset. It's usually a digital asset, but it could be anything with a unique certificate which sits on a, a cryptocurrency blockchain. At its most simple, that's, uh, that's all it is. But it's a way of assuring the authenticity of an asset. But it can be, crucially, it can be traded on, on, on trading platforms. But, and I think this is where having this discussion at the moment becomes interesting, the value of the item will always be pegged to that of the cryptocurrency on, which, on whose blockchain it is, uh, is encoded. And if, if, I don't know if you've been having a look at these uh, lately, but we're in an extremely volatile moment for those. Uh, and a lot of those at this moment are tanking. I looked at Ethereum, uh, one in which many uh, NFT, or art, at least art NFTs on which uh, they are stored is down 70% since January 1st. So it's, a, it's an interesting moment, I think, in the, uh, in the ongoing story of the, uh, of the NFT to, be, to begin this, uh, this discussion today. What I want to do to start is I just want to go ever so briefly through each of you have a specialist area that you come to represent and talk about. I just want you to say, a little bit about what is attractive for you about NFTs. And if we could start, Kenny, if you could speak from the perspective of an artist. From the perspective of a gadfly. Yeah. I mean, I'm really just, I'm not even interested in NFTs. And I don't really think NFTs are anything. I'm interested in art. I've been interested in art for my whole life. And I've been in the art world, whatever that is, uh, for 30, over 30 years even though I'm self-taught. But the art world, as has been mentioned before, can be a very exclusionary place. And there's a lot of compartmentalizing going on, a lot of pigeonholing going on, uh, a lot of judgments going on. And I always say the favorite word of the art world is no. They No, you can't do this, no, you can't do that, instead of knowing things. I'm just interested in art. I'm curious, I love to learn, I love to teach. I'm, a, I'm lecturing all the time, and I've been making art. But the art world would never consider me an artist because I curated, I did many different, I've played every role that you could play, from the idiot to professor and written for MIT. But again, like I love artists, artists like Vito Kanchi, conceptual artists, architecture, Zaha Hadid, various artists. But as an outsider, which I'll always consider myself, the only way I was able to get a foothold into having my art scene was by embedding, creating my own platform of embedding my videos into my writing for Artnet. And not until NFTs for the first time in my life have I been able to make a living doing the thing I'm most passionate about, passionate about making art. And for me, NFTs are nothing other than a certificate of authenticity 
for, for videos and digital art. Like, why should a Steve McQueen, one of the world's greatest contemporary artists with a show in the Pirelli Museum, why should his auction record be 32,000 or uh, Bill Viola, one of the foremost uh, video artists in the world, be well under a million? Why shouldn't digital art be on par with other forms of art? We live in digital times. You're all on your phones, on your computers. Art should reflect the times that we're in and d technology is culturally significant as much as social, political, and economic phenomena. So that's really it. I love art, and that's why I'm here. And NFTs have helped to facilitate, not only for me, but I love to create opportunities for other artists. That By teaching, I love to spend my life accruing information and the rest of it, bless you, sharing it with people. And that's really important to me, and I've helped to enable hundreds and hundreds of artists through my lecturing to take matters into their own hands, to go out. When I teach, I would never tell young students, I do studio critique, sorry. Uh, I tell artists, I would never tell them to try to get represented by an art gallery today. I would tell them to stage your own shows. There's been a systematic change to online commerce. There's empty storefronts in every city worldwide. Do your own shows, mint NFTs, and show your work and, and gain an audience. Uh, Christiana, Kenny's just suggesting cutting you out of the, the equation, but why are, galleries, uh, why are galleries increasingly interested in, in NFTs? Is it just because you can make some money with them, or is there something deeper there? No, I mean, I think um, just thinking of the history that Pace specifically has had in terms of trying to merge both the tech sector and specifically the fine art sector, it 100% made sense for us to move into the space. A lot of the artists that we represent are advanced studio practice artists. They have some element of a digital practice incorporated into their work. Um, and a lot of them were coming to us specifically very curious about the space um, and wanting to engage within the space. And as we understand, the technology has um, gives our artists so, many, so much opportunity specifically to expand beyond the bounds of you know, what a, a typical white cube specifically um, can confine an artist to in certain situations. So um, that's a huge reason why we wanted to enter the space. I think also a huge part of a gallerist's job or a gallery's job is to shepherd and protect artists. And this is still a space that's so much um, within its infancy, um, there's a lot of noise. Um, and I think that specifically Pace and other galleries as well, they have the resources and time um, to be able to develop relationships to ensure that their artists are navigating this space in a way in which is safe for their work, safe for um, their career. Um, and ultimately, could, could you say a bit about what's, what, what you can do with an NFT in a, that you couldn't do, say, in a white cube space? Well, um, I think actually John Gerard and his upcoming project is a perfect example for this. So, um, Pace Verso, our Web3 hub, is actually now partnered with a generative platform called Artblocks. Um, and John Gerard is actually going to be launching a project uh, next Tuesday called Petrol National. Um, and that project specifically is a generative project which uses um, uh, uh, WebGL, which is a JavaScript. Um, you, don't, you basically don't have to use any plugins. Um, that project specifically is based on uh, a generative piece that, you know, you would not be able, he would not be able to specifically have this within a normal traditional market. Um, it's specifically created a very, very special environment in which our artists can conceive a way in which they can actually place their work and play with concepts um, in a way in which, you know, within an analog environment, it wouldn't make any sense. And that's because you can sort of program instructions into it for how it's going to behave in the future, is that right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, Mezdak, a lot of um, new collectors have got involved uh, through NFTs. What is it that's drawing them in that they weren't seeing before in the traditional art world? I mean, I think, you know, we, we have a community of, of a new generation of collectors and you know more than two million of our community are under 35 and a lot of as you can imagine a lot of what they've been engaged around is um 
you know, is NFTs over the last couple of years. And I think there are a few different things um, driving that. I think, um, you know, I think one was access. And I think they were really energized around the fact that they could ac get access to a new community of artists and they could support artistic practice in, in ways for, for new communities of artists. I think, you know, that was accessible to them geographically because they didn't have to be in art metropolises. It was also, you know, going back to, to something um, Brian was talking about just now, it was also psychologically accessible to them because they, you know, maybe they didn't feel um, at home in a white box and, and you know, it's something that, that they had immediate access through the anonymity of being on the blockchain. Um, I think the, you know, just, just on the issue of anonymity, who are they? I mean, they're under 35, but could you characterize a sort of typical NFT buyer in any way other than that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's very easy to typecast, and I think there are, there's a huge range of, you know, we, we launched a project um, last month with an with a NFT artist and had 2,500 collectors trying to, trying to buy the piece, and there were a real range of people, lots of whom had, um, some of whom had, had supported public works and, and donated works to museums, some of whom, you know, for whom it was their first purchase. So it's, it's a real range. I think what's been exciting is just the energy that, that, you know, this new generation has had around it. I think, you know, to, to Christina's point, I think, you know, they've also been really excited about um, the creative possibilities that NFTs allow and, and, you know, using the smart contract and what's sort of different about the technology for artists to be able to express themselves. Could you explain for some of the audience who may not be so familiar, what, what would you say were those, uh, the things that you could do with an NFT that you can't do with something, with another type of art form? Yeah, so, you know, I think, I think Christina's example was a really good one. I think, you know, um, to take one of the artists we're working with, uh, David Rudnick, um, you know, he creates these sort of Tolkien-esque worlds of, um, you know, his, his practices around um, how information is stored and transmitted and, and lost, and he creates this sort of Tolkien-esque world of works um, and uses the, the smart contract as a means to, um, to express that. So um, both in how it's disseminated, but also how it's collected. Um, it often has a, an element of um, people coming together to transmit this work between them. Um, and that's all done through, this, through the coding within the smart contract of the NFT. So I, you know, maybe, maybe to um, um, slightly disagree with, with Kenny, I think there are, um, you know, I think there are artists using um, beyond just a beyond just a line of code and a JPEG. There are artists where form and content are really intermeshed. Kenny, another thing which attracts artists particularly to NFTs is that you can specify that artists take a cut of any kind of resale, uh, and that's you know that's obviously means that when it moves into a secondary market, usually that's a point at which artists sometimes don't benefit if they don't have smart lawyers or galleries to to stitch those kind of things up. How, in terms of artist finances, do you think, how much of that do you think is driving artists' interest in, in NFTs as a form? Well, I, I mean, that's a tremendous, that's a revolutionary concept that an artist can possibly get paid a royalty on the resale of their work in perpetuity. That never existed before. The Duat de Suite mainly, mainly, uh, helps artists that already have an art market, and besides, it's capped at $12,500. So although you have to be very careful because the royalty aspect is not baked into the smart contract, so you have to specify it with each platform, you sell your NFTs, but that's a tremendous aspect. And I don't think it's just, I mean, I've mentioned auction results, but I never got involved with NFTs for money whatsoever. I got involved to have to develop an audience and to have an opportunity to showcase my art in an art world that was very unwelcoming to me in relationship to my fine art practice. So I think I don't think artists make NFTs to make royalties or to make money. It's to have to be able to express themselves. Art is about communication. NFTs have developed new models of people communicating. David Bowie mentioned, of all people, quoting, sort of paraphrasing Marshall McLuhan, that the internet was uh, reducing the space between the artist and the audience. And with NFTs, art is not a static object that hangs on the wall, Duchamp said, that 
art in museums should have a shelf life and should be in a museum for 50 years. He was being, I guess, quasi facetious, but um, NFTs and digital art has facilitated, I don't say that NFTs are only, I mean, NFTs are anything, conceptual art that deals with computer code, the blockchain, but also I am in communication with my audience of people that engage with me every day in a platform called Discord. It's changing the way artists communicate with the public. I've had situations where I sell an artwork from a gallery and the gallery, I don't even know who bought my artwork. And with, with NFT space, I'm in communication with these people all the time. They criticize me, they encourage me, they inspire me. And I think that's really an integral part of what this is. In the best of possible worlds, this is about creating opportunities for people. I'm not a cash grabber. I'm not looking to make a quick profit. I'm also old, by the way. So this is not for young people. I'm 60 years old. And I've been trying to make my way in the art world uh, for 33 years, and only in the last two years have I been able to do so. I never gave up. I think dedication and perseverance are wildly important in the pursuit of loving art and never giving up because the art world is, is, doesn't offer a lot of opportunities unless you already have a market. And the last word is that, number one, like you mentioned lawyers, the art world is $65 billion a year and it's like 95% of the entire business is not contractually uh, tied together. There's no contracts between artists and galleries. That's a good thing, generally speaking, because that's why they're lawyers, because people do what they want anyway, regardless of the constructs of the law. And um, yeah, so I think that for me, it's a matter of just the royalty is fantastic. Flipping in the art world has such a terrible connotation. But if the artists are getting paid, it's going to make people a lot less annoyed. <laughs> I guess to your point, on, um, on the dialogue between sort of artist and audience, I think that's definitely something our community have been very engaged around. I think, you know, that idea, and it's not at all a new one, but that idea that the audience participating can be part of the work, I think has been something really inspiring to lots of people. Um, I think, you know, the elephant in the room is obviously, you know, to, back to your original question, um, Matthew, I think, you know, hype, has definitely driven a lot of interest around this space. And I think, you know, NFTs put art on the front cover of every broadsheet um, over the last two years, and that's driven a huge amount of new energy. But I think there is something, to your, to your point, Kenny, I think, you know, there's something more profound going on, which is about um, community and how, um, how different communities can engage around that shared interest in art and around the interactivity between artist and, and collector. Um, speaking to both of your points, I think from a gallerist's perspective, we're always consistently trying to find ways to grow our artist communities um, and to diversify them. And I think specifically with Web3 and also with NFTs, um, we've been able to have an opportunity to do that so organically um, in a way in which it feels more inclusive and it also involves the artists. I mean, Kenny, you're absolutely right. A lot of the times when artists are transacting with galleries, unless you know they really make a point to be hyperly involved, um, they don't always understand who their collector base is, who is their, who are their supporters. Um, and with this technology, um, with all of these creations that have come out of it, um, specifically speaking to Discord, um, we have our artists on these platforms engaging and talking directly to people um, who, you know, un unless you're at an art fair or a gallery opening, you wouldn't really have that opportunity to engage with an artist within that realm. Um, I think it also, this access to people as well is really changing the way in which artists are navigating their practices. Um, just thinking from like a global aspect, thinking of um, also the future of their work, the way in which people talk about their work. Um, there's so much room for opportunity. It all sounds very exciting, but I'd like to talk about some of the downsides of NFTs. We've been talking this morning about sustainability uh, in the art world and whether the current model uh, of distributing, creating, selling art is, is sustainable. But it seems that NFTs right from the get-go have an immediate carbon problem because the computing power required to create the thing, to mint it, 
produces incredible carbon uh, emissions. I saw some research from Cambridge University that suggested that um, in the previous year, the energy used in that was the same as used by Pakistan. That's a nation of 220 million people. So uh, these benefits all sound fantastic, and I think a lot of what you're talking about sounds very exciting, but they come at a cost. Um, maybe if I could start by asking you, Kenny, is it, is it worth it? It's worth it. <laughs> but first and foremost, as was mentioned in previous panels, we have to protect the planet. It's the most important. I mean, it's, it's, we need it to survive. We need to, to live in a hospitable place and not be thoughtless in relationship to exploiting the resource, the natural resources of the world. However, I think it's grossly exaggerated. I'm not talking about Bitcoin mining or Ethereum mining, which is terrible as it stands now, but Ethereum is on the brink of a major transformation from proof of work to proof of stake. And already there are burgeoning cryptocurrencies in relationship to NFTs like Solana, like Tezos, had a powerful impact in Basel and, uh, and they're carbon neutral. I mean, it's easy to dismiss things that are unfamiliar. It's human nature to reject change. And no one ever calculated the excessive consumption of the art business. A 60-foot wooden sculpture or bronze sculpture, I'm not mentioning any names, consumes a hell of a lot of resources uh, and energy. Traveling to Basel and they gauge the success of any given Basel fair according to how many private planes were in the parking lot in the local airport. Shipping crates for paintings and sculpture use a tremendous amount of uh, wood and waste and crates, shipping crates are used for one's, one use. And I'm not rationalizing anything I do. I gave a keynote lecture at University of Zurich last week at the Kunsthaus Museum and 80% of my 88 slides, lucky for you, you don't have to work, suffer through this, were negative. I'm very self-aware about what I do and what the implications are. And I, like I mentioned, Ethereum is meant to revise within the next six months or worst case scenario within a year. And there are other, Tezo, Solana outpaced Ethereum transactions for NFTs uh, in the last couple of weeks. And I see that the, I mean, to finish, the, the crypto market crashed 80% plus in the last seven months, and I welcome it. I think it's, the, it's fun, it's fabulous. Let it wipe away all of the excessive froth and speculation and people just, you know, the crime and the scams, and I mean, that's human nature. There's a bell's curve of morality and integrity in the world, but we need, to be, we need this to be washed out and left standing will be the people that care about art and making stuff and expressing themselves, whether it's commercial artists, digital artists, collectible people, whatever you're doing, I just think it's great to get rid of excessive speculation and focus more on what the content is because what's really needed in the space is more of a critical stance and a critical assessment and appreciation of what's been happening. And crypto technology transpires at like dog years. One year in technology is 15 years in real life and it's been an extraordinary thing to participate in and to observe and to watch. I'd like to come back to the crypto uh, crash, but first of all, I'd just like, um, I'd like for you to, to talk on the issue of, of environment and how that plays into collectors. Do you feel that collectors are making, are weighing these, uh, the, the benefits and the, uh, and the negatives, or do you think that that's not something that figures in their mind when they're buying? I definitely think, I mean, it, it figures in all of our minds, I think, as we go about life, and I think, and, and it probably doesn't enough. I think, um, you know, I think it is the biggest issue for NFTs as a, as a means of artistic expression is, is you know, versus the, the sort of current volatility, I think it's a, it's a huge issue. And I think, as Kenny says, there are sort of, you know, a number of different, um, you know, um, structural shifts that should make that much less impactful um, in the relative short term, but I, you know, it's a it's a big issue and it's on the minds of many collectors, and so they are diligencing, you know, which chains, how flexibly the architecture is built behind um, behind the NFTs that they're that they're buying, so that it can enable things like um, you know shifting to proof of stake in the in the future and other and other elements. 
Um, I'd like to add also that there are early adopters that have been, under, they've understood um, the ecological effects of this technology um, and have been trying to be as conscious as possible as they use it. Um, Pace Verso is a platform that also runs on proof of stake. It's a side chain off of mainnet Ethereum. Um, I, I think also specifically with a lot of the projects that our artists have done, um, they've tried to make sure that um, in some way there is a meaningful purpose to it. And I'm not saying that, you know, whatever any artist within um, the space is creating is not meaningful, but um, lasering back to John Gerard specifically with his Western flag NFT um, from last year or even this upcoming project, um, he's consistently been trying to have this conversation conversation and dialogue um, regarding CO2 emissions, um, making sure that a portion of the proceeds from the sales of these projects is also going back to um, uh, foundations and uh, uh, programs that specifically look into researching um, how we can make the planet better. Um, so there definitely are, you know, there's its shortcomings, but of course, as Kenny just said, um, uh, Ethereum 2.0 hopefully will be coming very, very soon. There's also lots of blockchains that don't have this devastatingly um, terrible ecological effect, which are actually re rising in popularity within the space as well. Yeah. What about the what about the crypto crash? Because I, th I, th um, Masik, I thought it was interesting when you said you know it's put art on the front page of newspapers for the first time in in a long time, and that's true. Part of that was to do with the fact that the Beeple was worth a lot of money. Uh, and I don't think too many people celebrated that as a great work of art. I think they were excited because it was expensive and it was something new, um, new technically. But as cryptocurrencies crash, NFTs aren't so expensive anymore. They're not so financially um, attractive. And uh, I wonder, I mean, first of all, maybe, um, Cristiano, if you could speak from the gallery uh, perspective, obviously there's sort of less incentive to be involved in these things if they're not going to make you such crazy money? Well, I mean, you know, of course, we're a business at the end of the day, and our bottom line is to make money. But a huge reason why we got involved within the space was not to make money. It was to benefit our artists. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that there's this great correction, which quite frankly is happening due to a, a ton of factors, inflation, the current state of the economy, but also in a lot of ways, many people reckoning with the fact that there has been so much noise in this space and quite frankly, projects that they do not want to invest in, um, with that prices are going to go down. Um, and what people feel they should be paying is what they're going to pay. Um, I think there's actually a lot of opportunity there, specifically from the traditional market standpoint. Um, there historically has only been a specific few people that can actually interact within um, the traditional fine art market. Now with um, NFTs, with cryptocurrency, um, engaging within the space, we do have an opportunity to have our artists be able to offer works to a different market, um, you know, at a lower price, which also grows their communities, which also helps with engagement. Um, I mean, a lot of the projects that artists do within this space are, um, larger projects. I mean, we're talking about, uh, for instance, with John Gerard's piece, um, there's 196 unique NFTs that will be released. Um, typically, you know, within the traditional art market, there's uh, unique works or smaller editions, definitely not producing at that volume. Um, so, you know, I mean, while at face value, you're not getting these eye boggling, um, ridiculous numbers, there's still a lot of value. Um, and that's not just directly connected um, to, you know, how much someone's going to pay. Um, we'll have some time for questions from the floor, but I just want to um, ask Mazak first, in your um, experience in connecting um, collectors and artists, is the fact that the, the price of them is dropping or the value is decreasing, is that bringing new people into the market? Or because sometimes the, in, in the art world, as we know, economics is sometimes totally on their head. Um, but is that something that you're experiencing that because they're easier to, to get access to, people are buying them? 
I think it's a little too early to tell where where this all all sort of levels out. I think you know what's been interesting is that a lot of the um, the artists that have been making, for example, you know, from the generative tradition, their pricing has actually remained quite robust, um, and I think it really does. You know, as Kenny says, I think it sort of separates the the people that are sort of invested in the medium as a way to express themselves artistically, and and those who are maybe attracted to it by seeing. Um, you know, the people front page. I mean, I, I would maybe just challenge the terms of the question a little bit on, on people because I was actually talking about this in a, in a cab last night, but, you know, the, you know when um, I, I listened to a podcast from the, from the um, collector who bought that Beeple edition, uh, the, the piece, and, you know, he said, he said that the main reason that, that he collected it was that you know, everything now can be hacked digitally. You can hack anything um, apart from time. And, you know, the, the Beeple piece for him was a representation of the lack of fungibility of time because it was made over 5,000 days. And so I think, you know, there are, there's referentiality in, in these works that talk about the value system that they're secured by. I think there's collectors that are engaging on sort of theoretical... Um, academic and and you know artistic levels with it so yeah i think there are sort of multiple layers just to um yeah challenge the original question we've got some time for some questions from the audience if anyone has any um stadium hello thank you uh, the beginning of this week, it was a global advisory board of Citibank here in Athens in um, the Four Seasons Hotel. And of course, they covered a lot of financial things that banks covered. And in one of the panels, they spoke very professionally about NFTs. And they have a section already developed, and they had people there that were explaining and promoting this kind of business for them. Also, um, advancing art, as you said, mostly advertising artists. And we went, a lot of people went to different questions there because a lot that we don't understand. First of all, let's say you have a piece of art. And they told us you put that in the form of a movie or something like that. You give it to the bank and they have these people there that they sell it in different pieces. The question was how many of those you sell. You sell. It's like uh, having uh, shareholders. Second thing, where is the original art, art is kept? Who has the original art? And how this art is insured? Then how you do resale of that art? <laughs> If there were so many questions, and every time you think about it, there's more questions that come up, you know. So I would like to have some answers to that from the point of view of the artist, but also from the point of view of the buyer. And another thing that might sound very stupid... I think that might be enough for the panel uh, okay. just now. Kenny, do you want to take that from the point of view of the artist? I would say, can you repeat that? But, <laughs> but I'm not going to. But, I mean, how to parse that out? What were the... Okay, first of all, you mentioned fractionalization. If you want to buy fractionalized stuff, go to the stock market. If you want to buy shares, you don't have a lot of money, go to Robinhood. Although I don't care, you could do whatever you want with your money and your art, but I love art and I love to collect it. My house is wallpapered with it. I had a question for you, sir, and you're, I would like to know what art is still in your bedroom. What, who do you share your bedroom with in terms of what artist did you keep? And what you said about like being a custodian, you never own art, art owns you. I think that breaking up art and turning it more into an asset class than it already is at Sotheby's and Christie's, young artists selling for historic prices with no history is atrocious. All the art coming up for sale from 2021 and 20, the, you smell the paint at Sotheby's and Christie's. It didn't used to be like that. I have no, I'm not here to talk about a commodities pit. That's not my interest on any level. So what was your other, give me the second one and then I'll, how do you, Okay, that's a great question. Insured, I don't want to get into detail. How and, is it insured? No, this is, this is a really... Let's just have that. Who keeps wait, the original Just one, one quick question. This is a really... 
I don't want to, like, I know it's been a long day, and I've been through conferences, and it's really good to cure insomnia or something by the end of the day, so I'm not going to go into, but like, right now, the, primarily speaking, in 90% of the cases, the art is not on the blockchain. The art, it's only the contract that uh, describes the art. So in the past, in a nutshell, you buy a, a Carl Andre or Sal LeWitt or a Dan Flavin piece, and you get a paper certificate of authenticity. When these things were not traded at high values, and most of the people buying them were artists and crazy art lovers, they would lose these certificates, and these things cannot be reissued posthumously. So in artwork, you can have the greatest Dan Flavin. I went to Franz West studio, and he had a particularly great one. Of course, he drank a lot. He lost his certificate of authenticity. So now you have this, now the whole system's turned upside down. The certificates of authenticity are forever preserved on the decentralized network of computers known as the blockchain. But the actual art, when I make a video and, and it's sold in the form of an NFT, that in the smart contract it has an address, a URL, a computer address, and it points to where the art is stored. It's stored in the cloud. When I sold a series of NFTs, which was a satire on the board, eight blah blahs. And when I did these, I have to pay storage fees. They're $3 a month, every month. Otherwise, the 9,000, addition of 9,000 NFTs I sold will, will evaporate. So in three years, when every person opens up their wallet to look at their NFT collection, I can all but assure you about a third of it is going to go missing because there's going to be consolidation, there's going to be all kinds of problems, people going out of business, people not paying their storage. Again, like none of this dissuades me from following the dream that I've had for decades, which is to be involved in art. And there's going to be ways to fix this. You have to protect yourself, you have to use caution, and you have to copy your own art, right click save and save your own art because if you rely on these other systems, you can get in trouble. And again, like when people say this art could be infinitely copied, so could a Cindy Sherman if she decided to continue to print off her negatives or Richard Prince could to, to decide to continue to pull silk screens of his nurse paintings, which he may have done, I've heard, but I'm not gonna comment on him. So there are a lot of different issues. This is a nation field in the embryonic stage. NFTs have been around since late 2017. The market in earnest has only been happening for a few years. This is exciting. We live in technological times and this is really interesting and engaging, but there's, it's, it's rife with problems. But that doesn't mean you give up on it, it means you improve upon those issues. I think we have time for one more question. Um, this lady here. Okay. Is it on? Oh. Hi, um, I'm Megan McGee, and I'm with Art Vault, which is a tech startup around art and uh, image recognition. So I think you can imagine that, like many people here in the audience, um, we've tried to kind of follow the evolution of NFTs and listening to lots of different podcasts and videos online and trying to understand exactly all the benefits and, um, you know, the detriments and things like that. Um, but one of the things that I didn't hear mentioned was provenance, which I found to be really kind of interesting because I think maybe it's more of a secondary market issue. Um, but there are many fakes and many uh, forgeries that go into auction houses and things like this. So I didn't know if the provenance issue was something that any of you have come up with in your experience so far with NFTs. Christiana, is that something you've dealt with? Um, fortunately, not yet. <laughs> um, a lot of the projects that we've conceived on the blockchain, thinking of like Lucas and Mars, this XYZ NFTs, or Studio Drift, or uh, Jean Juan, these are all projects that specifically are native to the digital space and also just specifically created um, as an NFT project. Um, so, you know, I mean, we have not uh, come across that issue yet. I mean, we definitely have had conversations in terms of using the technology as a way to create provenance for actual physical assets. There are entities out there that are using this technology to actually do that um, and partnering with artists on that. Um, but, you know, fortunately, having our own platform and having great security measures, you know, we haven't really come into that issue. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
Thank you. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Some difficult conceptual material in there, but I think everyone did a great uh, job of making that feel uh, accessible and uh, and relevant. So thank you very much. For the final panel uh, of um, of this afternoon, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague Rosan Silkus, who's going to uh, take it away with that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.